Okay, Tenda Murray. Sister Tenda Kai. Murray. Yeah. Um, Brother Robin, now I had the pleasure of meeting Baba Ben in the early 80s. I think I was in probably my early 20s yeah. at the time. And I, I was obviously very moved and, you know, followed him all over the place when he came here. And I, a number of times I saw him brought to tears when he was delivering his presentations. Um, what, what do you feel it would take? What kind of person do you think it would take to take on such a task as Baba Ben took on? Um, um, a very brave, confident individual. Because essentially you're taking on um, not just um, a racist establishment, but you're also taking on religious bigotry as well. And he let them have it with both barrels. And what normally happens is, is most scholars will either go after one target or the other. They don't usually go after both. Mm -hmm. Because Ben Yochanan's main point, if you were to sum up, what is Ben Yochanan trying to teach the community? Racism wasn't the only argument that was used against black history. Religious bigotry was also used against it. Mm-hmm. Could you just elaborate, um, Brother Robin, how, how was religious bigotry used? Because people probably get the racism um, argument. The religious bigotry. Yeah. yeah the, 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 essentially, um, there's a concept that anthropologists use, and the concept was called the Hamites. Uh-huh. And the Hamites were, if you can't disprove that a civilization was, pro- was built by black people, then anthropologists used to say, okay, they were built by black people, but these black people belong to a race of people called Hamites. Right. And so the ancient Egyptians became Hamites, the ancient Ethiopians became Hamites. Everywhere where there was evidence of a civilization just claimed that the population were Hamites. And what, what was it so, spe- so special or otherwise about the Hamites? Because they could be classified as Caucasians. Oh, right. <laughs> that, that's what the whole intellect... And if you um, look at some of the old physical anthropo- anthropology books, there was a scholar called uh, C.G. Seligman, mm-hmm. one of the scholars that Ben Yochanan roundly beats up in his books. Right. He was the person that coined the Hamitic hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, what's this got to do with religion? Well, the the concept of Ham and Hamitic is coming straight out of the Bible. Okay, the good book. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And then it may amaze um, scholars, excuse me, may amaze listeners to believe that a religious idea was being used by physical anthropologists to deny black people their history. But that is exactly how it went down. You know, you've got the whole story in the Bible of Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Yes, but elaborate. They become the, the, the children of Ham. Mm-hmm. And this was the intellectual argument that people were using to classify the founders of civilization as dark-skinned Caucasians as opposed to blacks. So Europe, European, uh, European scholars who would beat up, who would try to beat up African scholars about sources and about evidence and about facts etc they were drawing straight from the bible absolutely as their evidence that's right but what it was you see is because when cg seligman came up with the hermetic hypothesis he didn't say he got it from the bible right yeah um and it was dr ben that exposed that okay you follow me? Yes. Now, because a lot of people couldn't follow what Dr. Ben was saying, they couldn't see the importance of what he's just said. Mm-hmm. Similarly, you've got the idea that black people then, um, if they want to be denied civilization, then the civilization builders become Hamites. Right. If you want to justify the slave trade, you use the same argument. Black people are the cursed seed of Ham. Mm-hmm. You must have heard that one. Right? Oh, most, most definitely. It, it, it's still being propounded even now. And I'm, sure, and, and I'm and sure... Dr. Ben was the first to show the black community that the original source of this was the Babylonian Talmud. Mm-hmm. And what he did was to quote from the Talmud, curse be Canaan. All this stuff about Canaan having been cursed turns black. And just remind our listeners what, what the Talmud is. It's um, uh, a document that 
accompanies the Old Testament is used in rabbinical Judaism. Right. And uh, you have... The, you, said, you said Judaism, right? Which becomes the basic text, and the Talmud becomes the, the rabbi's interpretation of the text. Right. So this is a Jewish... Can I, can I just verify? You said a Jewish text, yeah? Indeed, and Dr. Ben, right. because he's got that same um, Jewish background, he would know that this is what's there. Right. I see. Right. Tenemai. Bro- Brother Robin, I-, I-, I wanted to move on to something, a- another aspect of not just Baba Ben, but our scholars, our historians, Baba John Henry Clark, etc., mm-hmm. um, regarding the attack on Afrocentric scholars, particularly um, a woman by the name of Mary Lefkowitz. Uh, mm-hmm. um, now, how how um influential or otherwise was baba ben in that um f- if you like that tussle with uh these i think these i think these were european jews who tried to disprove the whole concept of afrocentric scholar scholarship mm-hmm. um mary Leskovitz um was a lot more measured than her supporters gave her credit for in other words, while I don't agree with Mary Leskovitz, she is a scholar. And I mean that quite sincerely. She is a scholar. And because she's a scholar, she knows what she can say. And most importantly, she knows what she can't say. Yeah? So a lot of people assumed that Mary Leskovitz said African history is all rubbish, we're making it up. Because that's what her supporters said that she said. When you actually go and read what she actually said, her claims are much more measured, her targets are much more focused. And what's really interesting is not so much what she says, but what she doesn't say. Okay. So, for example, um, uh, in challenging Ben Yochanan, she says that Ben Yochanan says that the original Jews were black like him. She doesn't say it's not true. She says, but there are non-black Jews as well. Right. Now, you'd expect her to say, rubbish, Mm -hmm. Jews were white. She doesn't say that. She says there were white Jews as well. Now, can you see that's a measured position? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people didn't see that subtlety in her arguments. Right. The main problem she had with Ben Yochanan was um, over the issue of... Ben Yochanan is one of the reasons why black scholars promote George James. You know George James? George Stolen Legacy, Legacy, yes, George M. James. The reason why that book is popular, the reason why the black community reads it, is because of Ben Yochanan. Yeah? That was her main target. Okay, so so what is it about the book? What is it about the book that... um that she wanted to challenge. Okay, her argument essentially was this. She says that George James was a Freemason. Freemasonry informed his understanding of ancient Egyptian thinking. But the Freemasons had already come up with their ideas on what the ancient Egyptians thought before the hieroglyphs had been deciphered. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what they said the ancient Egyptians believed must be wrong. That was her argument. Right. Yeah? Okay. Now, what she didn't do was to check. Now that we've got the decipherment of the hieroglyphics, is George James's presentation of it Accurate. correct or incorrect? Mm-hmm. That's what she didn't deal with. Right. You follow me? Yeah. And... I've been through it, and there are errors in George James's presentation of the ancient Egyptian thought, definitely. Mm-hmm. But the errors are not serious enough to undermine what he just said. Right. And when you correct George James, as later scholars have done, like Jacob Carruthers, mm-hmm. it's even easier to prove that the Greeks ripped off Egyptian philosophy. Right. In other words, when you correct George James, it, it looks... Ad, it adds more weight. ...the Greek stuff that the, the Greeks ripped off. Right. Now, Mary Lefkowitz probably knew that, but she didn't want to go there. Mm-hmm. 
That's the reason why she came with the argument. George James is basing it on Masonic sources, and the Masonic sources had come up with their model before the hieroglyphs had been deciphered. That's why she goes down that route. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that, um, Brother Robin. Don't worry. Brothers and sisters, we're talking to Brother Robin Walker, historian, author of When We Ruled and a number of other books. And um, just to say, this subject is why do we need to know our history? We are honoring the late Baba Yosef Benja Cannon, who passed on the 19th of March. Now, Mara, we have a text here, and it said, Please, can you ask Robin Walker about the value of Dr. Ben's first-hand research in traveling to the Nile Valley yes, for 50-plus years and uncovering our ancient history? Yes, it's definitely so. something I was going to come to the work he's done. But, go, but, Robin, the question has been asked by our listeners, so can I put that over to you, please? Okay, the, the most important thing is that um, he's our first Egyptologist in English. Right. That's very, very important. He was the first to popularize Egyptology in the black community in the English language. Um, okay, his, his most important books on e ancient Egypt are Africa, Mother of Western Civilization, uh, probably Black Man and the Nile of His Family, and definitely um, from Abu Simbel to Giza, which is his travel guide. You know, he did a travel guide in ancient Egypt? Right. Yeah. In other words, a tourist guide. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The monuments, what's there, and so on, so on, and so forth. Um, okay, well, the main findings of Dr. Ben is the there's a doc, there's an, uh, uh, an inscription called the Stela of Samna. Let me explain what that is. Please. Before Dr. Ben, there weren't any black scholars who could read any hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben, I gather, could read a bit, but the bit that he could read was enough to blow it up. Right. There was an inscription um, called the Steeler of Samna, where a pharaoh, the pharaoh's name is Sinodret the Third, put down a boundary inscription between Egypt and Nubia. And he warned the Nubians, if you cross this boundary, we kick your butts, or something like that. Mm -hmm, but right. to that extent, huh? Now, the document contained the word for Nubian as Nehezi. Mm -hmm. And that document had been systematically mistranslated by Egyptologists to say Negro. Mm -hmm. So this boundary inscription that banned Nubians from entering Egypt was then mistranslated as this document had banned Negroes from entering Egypt. Mm -hmm. Very convenient. Right? And then this was then used as first-hand evidence that the ancient Egyptians can't be Negroes. <laughs> because why would there be a document banning Negroes from entering ancient Egypt? Mm -hmm. Now, to put it into perspective, um, W.E.B. Du Bois saw this same inscription. He couldn't explain it. Chancellor Williams saw the same inscription. He couldn't explain it. John Jackson ignores the inscription and just doesn't even get into the argument. G.K. Osai saw the inscription. He couldn't explain it. The first person in the English language to say, I can explain it, the document is a fraud, it didn't say that, was Ben Yochadon. All right, all right. And then that was very, very important because what Ben Yochadon had done was to remove the strongest argument that Eurocentric liars mm -hmm. had had against the ancient Egyptians being Africans. Mm. They used to be able to translate the word Nehezi to mean Negro and then use it as proof that the Egyptians were not Nehezi, so they were not Negroes. Mm. Do you get it? Yeah, we get it. We get it, my yeah. brother. And Yokono was the first person to blow that fraud open. We've got a lot to thank Yosef ben, uh, Baba Yosef Ben-Jakanan for. Brother